That breaking news is out of Athens, where state investigators have ruled out foul play in the death of the University of Georgia student. She was not murdered. That's what investigators have concluded tonight from an autopsy on the body of 22-year-old Rebecca Elaine Green. However, the investigators have not said how they believe the young student from Glen County died. We're covering this tragedy from all angles tonight. Well, this really is a tragedy for two communities tonight, for the people who knew Rebecca Green back home in her hometown of Brunswick, the people she grew up with, the people who watched her grow up, and for people here in Athens who went to school with her at the University of Georgia. Her body was found here in the creek behind me early this morning, just a few blocks away from where she lived. And late tonight, we learned her death was not a homicide. The bicycle found on the banks and the body in the shallow water of this creek has stunned this neighborhood not far from the UGA campus. The people who knew 22-year-old Rebecca Green call it nothing short of a tragedy. The chemistry major from Brunswick lived in West Athens with two roommates. Investigators tell me Monday evening at 5.30, her boyfriend spoke with her about meeting on campus, but she never showed up and no one ever spoke to her again. A neighbor and fellow UGA student tells me Green's boyfriend went door to door Tuesday morning. He approached her and said, have you seen her? You know, we have, I haven't talked to her since last night. I found her book bag, um, et cetera, et cetera. A couple hours later, athens Clark County Police, now working a missing persons case, tracked Green's cell phone to this area just a few blocks from her house. The day-long investigation put the people who live here, many of them college students, on edge. They tell me they're still a long way from knowing exactly what happened to Green, but late Tuesday, they confirmed she was not the victim of foul play. The GBI medical examiner needs to do more tests to determine if she was killed in an accident or a suicide. There is an old saying that there are two sides or more to every story. Rebecca's story seems to have at least two. Here's a girl that friends say was a salt of the earth. She was honest, trustworthy, caring, loving, hardworking, and dedicated life. As a parent goes, who could ask for a better child? And as a friend, one couldn't ask for a better pal. She would give you the shirt off her back. In our interview with friends close to her, not one believed she committed suicide. In fact, they were very upset that the final official conclusion was that she had. Perhaps it's too early for those friends, but it's interesting to note that not one of them wanted to go on camera and talk about her. At the time she died, she was about to graduate in just six months. She would have graduated with a major degree in chemistry and a minor in psychology. She was a very good student with good grades, even while she worked part-time at a local grocery store just off campus. People there, like everywhere, loved her. She was a Christian, and she knew it was a sin to commit suicide. She was a person connected to nature and cared about the environment. She loved animals, and particularly horses. Even at the early age of 22, she was a certified yoga instructor. If you look close at this girl, there's only one fault she seemed to have. She was too trusting. A very close friend of hers in an interview with WUGA-TV the day after Rebecca's body was found said, she loved being here. To some, the following might seem to be the most likely reason Rebecca was where she was that night. It's been six months since we've learned of the passing of Rebecca Green, who perished in this tiny little creek on November 18, 2013. The cross which once stood there is gone. So are the markings in the grass near the bike that looked like a violent scene had taken place that night. And the path of crushed grass from the bike to the bottom of the culvert section is gone as well. No one seemed to care that this once relatively safe neighborhood over the last few years because of good police protection had changed dramatically. Some months before the ill-fated night the police moved out and the criminals moved back in. Unfortunately, Rebecca was not aware of the danger she was putting herself in when she went there that night. Nevertheless, she came up with what some might think was a brilliant plan. It was not a secret that Rebecca was questioning her relationship with her boyfriend and was considering ending her relationship with him and moving on with her life. Yes, she was a practical girl, so she was going to test her boyfriend's love for her. Is he my white knight in shining armor or just another Don Juan? That was a real question that needed answering, and she came up with a plan, a variation of an old theme. Romeo and Juliet belonged to a tradition of tragic romances stretching back to antiquity. Men and women have been faking suicide for tension for centuries. Diphenyl hydramine 
a drug typically found in non-prescription sleeping aids, by itself usually does not kill, but used in high doses can give a hallucinogenic trance state. One just usually wakes up with a bad case of drunken-like hangover. She bought the medication herself. Her plan was not to answer her phone and go to a place she liked away from home. Because of the attractive stream and knowing how her boyfriend knew it was a favorite place of hers, she went there. That's why she chose the spot. She left clues like her book bag under her boyfriend's car so he would know that she had made it home. She also left her bike on the hill close to a stream so it would easily be seen by him from the street. The one thing she didn't count on was that he would not care enough to come look for her. It was a costly mistake and one that would cost her her life. This story became a hot one within a few hours and it's not hard to see why the official findings in the case are doubted by so many. At that time, imaginations were running wild. The internet was buzzing with what really happened to her. Many rumors started to spread. Almost all of them proved to be unfounded. Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. I have been so upset because I went to the plaza one night in mid-November of last year, around 9 o'clock at night. And I saw this nice looking bike sitting over there on this hill. I walked over to it and didn't see anybody, so I thought it'd be okay to take it. Suddenly out of nowhere this boy says, this is my bike. And she tries to take it away from me. I said, no, it's my bike now. I didn't know what came over me. We fought over that bike around and around. Finally I had enough and I shoved the bike at her and she fell backwards to the ground. I started to walk away with the bike and look back and saw that she, she, was, she looked dead. I ran over to it and she wouldn't come to life. I did everything I could. I shook her, I woke her, I tried my best to do it, but she wouldn't come too. I got to thinking that if I left her here like this, someone would think I did it. So I, uh, I grabbed her arms and pulled her down to the bank until I got to the edge of the creek. Then I drug her over to the deepest part. I strained out her legs and crossed her arms one over one over the other. And then when I was getting there, I thought that it's not deep enough. There's not enough water here. There's no way they're going to think she drowned. And then her phone rang, and for some reason I just answered it. I heard this guy's voice, so I hung it up and threw it down. Suddenly, I, I, I saw lights. I saw lights of a car coming around the corner, so I ducked behind the retainer wall. After the car passed, I, I got up and ran. I, I, I ran like a, until I couldn't run no more. I ran so fast I could barely catch my breath. And I just went home and fell, fell to the bed and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and thought, oh, that was just a bad dream. That it was just, that it just didn't happen. I walked down to the plaza and I saw that all these cop cars and ambulances and even a helicopter was in the sky. I then knew that what I'd experienced was not a dream, that I did that. A cop came over and asked me if I knew anything about this and I said no. And then and then he told me to get on to, to leave, to get off the property. And I said, yes sir. And then a few days later I saw I saw read it on the newspaper that she died from overexposure to cold water. Oh my god, I killed this girl. She wasn't going to die, she passed on a bit of drill. I killed her, I, I, she just, I killed her just as she was the world. Three months before Rebecca died, this heron lost his mate in the exact same place that she did. He knows his mate's gone, but he doesn't know why. It seemed to be environmental poison caused by leak in an aging, neglected sanitary sewer system. But he doesn't know this, so he keeps coming back, looking for answers. My grandmother told me something when I was a young boy that I pondered over for most of my long life. She said that suicide is the greatest of all evil that a person can do. And I asked her why. She said, because those left behind are left to suffer the most. Those that pass on are forever cursed because sin is forgivable, but you have to request it to be forgiven. And those that do such things are no longer here to ask for it. For those who knew her, no Rebecca would have never purposely hurt so many people. So who created the greatest wrong? Rebecca Lane Green, who may have never considered such a thing as suicide, or those that say that she did. <laughs>